welcome to this amazing event. I'm, I'm Fergus Murray, I'm the chair of AMAID, the Autistic Mutual Aid Society Edinburgh, and I'm talking with Elwick Nichol, author of A Kind of Spark and various other books. So we're going to talk about writing and reading and representation and neurodiversity, um, and probably a bit about place, because, um, you know, we are the Autistic Mutual Aid Society Edinburgh, and I believe you are originally from Edinburgh. Um, yeah, I am from Edinburgh. Yeah, I'm from Juniper Green, which is a it's like five miles outside of Edinburgh. Um, they it's it's a weird little village, and some of them like they like to think that they're not from Edinburgh, like they're their own little like, yeah. separate state, but they are. Um, it is yeah. part of Edinburgh. I've so, got yeah. friends in Juniper Green. Um, I was going to ask actually because a kind of spark is set in Juniper, which is yeah. like what very I similar. Green. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so someone commented on Instagram the other day, they were, because the show's out at the moment, my first book's been adapted for television, and someone replied and was like, oh, Juniper, the 44 bus goes there, doesn't it? I was like, no, it goes to Juniper Green, which is, uh, which is the real version, and the fictional version is very fictional. Uh, yeah, it's definitely inspired by my 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 home village of, of Juniper Green, um, which if you've been to Juniper Green, you'll know, you'll see the comparisons. But um, yeah, it's uh, slightly less narrow-minded in the real Juniper Green, I think. I mean, that was slightly less narrow-minded in the real Green Green, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Slightly less. Um, so I was wondering about your your neurodivergent journey. Well, I was diagnosed with my with dyspraxia at nine, and I remember. So I'm thirty. For anyone um, needing to know, and so we knew what dyslexia was, um, but dyspraxia was like <laughs> this weird cousin that nobody ever talked about. And I remember when I was doing the tests and I was doing everything um, at the hospital, I was like, this is all very well and good. I'm doing these handwriting exercises. I'm doing these these motor skills uh, tests, but I don't know what this is for. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why they are, what they're trying to find or why they're trying to find it. And my family were very much, and I was diagnosed with autism afterwards, um, but I, I was never told this is what these conditions are and this is what they mean. And this is why it's good to know about them. It was never a conversation. My family are very anti-label. Like they didn't like the idea of there being labels. And um, my school did. They were the ones that pushed for the diagnosis because they said that it was noticeable in my my school work and my school life. Um, which I think is very common for a lot of young neurodivergent kids, is the two, the schools pick up on it very quickly. Um and uh, my parents were like, well we'll take that paperwork home, but we're never going to talk about it again. And so I think it wasn't until my 20s when I had a proper, proper nervous breakdown um, because I couldn't handle working an office job. I couldn't deal with office politics. It just wasn't making sense to me. And um, and the commute every day was was hellish and it was London. And I just had a complete nervous breakdown. And my doctor said, you have to start actually acknowledging these these disabilities, these, these um, neurodivergencies and and start you know treating yourself like an autistic person and giving yourself a break and not pushing yourself into sensory overload and then that was kind of my journey and then I started actually talking about it so I think some people are surprised to hear that because of the books that I write that I did go a very long time not talking about it because I thought it was something I shouldn't talk about and I think a lot of people my generation have still are still unlearning that um well, there's the kids I speak to now in schools are like, I love being autistic. It's the best thing ever. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. But that wasn't <laughs> what it was like when I was young. Um, and so, years, huh? yeah, it's a big difference. But um, so the books are very empowered. You know, they're all about being empowered and being proud and being, you know, no matter what the characters go through, they never at any point say, I hate this. This is horrible. I wish I could take this part out of me. Um, and not in any serious way. So that's always been important to me. But it's because I just was given these diagnoses and I went, what are these? <laughs> I don't know what do I do with this information. So I'm really writing for that reader, that kid that's like, I don't know what this is. Um, that was a long answer, but that's that's the journey basically of neurodiversity and me. Yeah, like I I was assessed as autistic at the age of 31. Um, I'm 44 now. Um, wow, that's that's late. It's late, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's not that late. I know people who've been been assessed. Oh no, yeah, that's, yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I was growing up, I there, there was basically no way that I would have been assessed as autistic. Um, 
And it's just conceived like I'd have got an Asperger's diagnosis after, I don't know, 93 or something. But nobody was really sort of thinking. No one was looking, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm curious, was it much later that you, you got assessed as autistic? Um, no, I was still a young person. It yeah. wasn't that yeah. much later. Um, my, my parents weren't as involved. Um, they were less than, I, I don't, I, this is being recorded, so I won't, I won't go too, too personal, but um, it, there was a gap between them and I still, I understood what autism was because, well, well, I'd heard of autism when I was diagnosed, but I remember viscerally, and this is something that I try not to talk about too much with my young readers. So if there's anyone young on the call, you, this is this is a, quite a complex feeling I'm about to talk about. But when I was told I was autistic, I kind of was like, no, no, not not me. That's that's incorrect. I I'm not that. What that is, I had very negative ideas of what that was. Mostly because I'd only seen men and and cis men who were autistic. So I, I thought that's not. And I really it really unsettled me which is really sad and, and not, um, not, not on brand for what I do now, but at the time I was very young and I just thought, um, that's not, and that's not what I do. That's not who I am. Um, yeah, it's a different world now, right? And the, the people understand these things very differently. Um, well, it's so much more accepted. Which is why it's so important that people are doing what you're doing now. Um, so yeah, you know, I, being assessed in adulthood, my autism diagnosis helped make sense of my life so far um and you know with that happening in you know the 2010s um and that's that's an experience that's common i think to a lot of people who are diagnosed you know relatively late uh, and i'm, and I'm really... always I, I love talking to late diagnosed people because they always say a lot of late diagnosed people say oh i i i, I knew already i just i i needed to get that um that stamp or whatever but i already knew i've been researching for years because of course if autism becomes your special interest you can become an expert in it with your with your absolute hyper focus but um but that's something i've always kind of envied because when i talk to late diagnosed people and they say oh I, I i already had worked it out for me it was like being hit by a truck i just had no it was which is true for a lot of young people we just mm -hmm. it did not see it coming so mm -hmm. it's amazing how different this journey is for every i mean everybody on this call will have a different story it's just yeah. I actually wasn't sure until my assessment. Um, which is kind really? of, my mum was a, you know, a, a well-known autism expert, but it sort of took us both, both until around 2010 before we were really sort of, you know, confident enough to actually get an assessment. Um, wow. you know, it, it varies so much from person to person. And, you know, and in I, a lot I, of ways, I feel like an imposter most days. I'm like, oh, I don't, sometimes, some days I'm like, oh, maybe they got it wrong. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's that thing of um, people's ideas about autism being so much shaped by perception yeah. of autistic white boys, right? Um, um, and my autism very closely fits stereotypes about so-called female autism. Um, I, my, I think very much like my mum in a lot of ways, you know, we're like, mm. you know, socially because we're very interested in people yeah i'm talking about my mum in the past tense and actually she died <laughs> but anyway um so yeah everyone has such different experiences it's it's kind of main stuff um so places um a kind of spark being set in juniper in the tv series juniper's just outside of manchester is that right <laughs> Yeah, it seems so. Yeah, um, it's still set in Juniper in the fictional world. Um, and uh, we don't mention that it's Manchester. I know this was the whole thing and I get so much abuse about this online. Um, but um, the it's like political. The BBC have different like departments and BBC Scotland were not the ones making the show. So they didn't film it in Scotland. Um, they were the, we were the northern branch, so they filmed in the north of England. But I said, can we please still it's still Juniper and it, can we please not say any English? city or town names and they said yeah um okay. we've got like jacobite store we've got like lots of scottish references in it um but yeah it, it broke my heart when we I, ha I kind of had to choose between autism and, and scotland because <laughs> they said well we'll find the perfect main main actor and then we'll cast around them and mm -hmm. the, the the person we saw for addy was lola and we'd seen a lot of i mean <laughs> seen every secondary character almost had been cast and apart from the family and then we saw Lola and she, of course, 
doesn't have a Scottish accent, but she was just perfect. The most brilliant autistic 17 year old. And I was like, I'd rather, I'd rather we have a brilliant autistic actor who's perfect for the role than have accent purity. But, um, but it is sad. It would have been lovely. We've got Scottish actors in the show and they do a very good job, but, um, Lola is English. So the show became, uh, an English family. Yeah, but, thinking about it and there's not that much about a kind of spark really that is very Scottish specific whereas yeah um, like a charm you really couldn't move out of Scotland no right? that was that was it so like a charm is being developed for tv and they said do you have any um any big like you know are you do you have any big requirements I said it has to be in Scotland I'm afraid or it's not going to make any sense um so like, nice Charm, in, in, like Liverpool or somewhere right yeah I know like Ray Farr Bobby lives in one city in one city alone and that is Edinburgh so yeah that would be fine but um no a kind of spark um the, we have the witch trials of Scotland mentioned in it but there were a lot of witch trials in the north of England as well um and in this in this show they do say the witch trials of Scotland so um it's that that history is is there but um yeah we but it's very much the location is this fictionalized little village which is insp is inspired by my my home village um and it's just that weird experience of growing up where everybody knows everybody and they kind of everyone opens their own mail each other's mail and they all like i just i was so used to never having anonymity and just everybody's a bit famous like everyone knows you somehow and um it's why i've lived in big cities my whole life as an adult because Juniper Green was very, very insulated, but um, it's still alive and well in the TV show. <laughs> it's just got <laughs> slightly different accents. I'm, I'm curious about the the whole process of it getting adapted for TV. Um, so, I mean, what happened? You you had this successful book. You were approached to have yeah. it. So the book was kind of a slow burn. I feel like it was really successful with a lot of autistic people straight away because I knew a lot of autistic people. And obviously I said like, this is kind of for us or for the kids that we were. And so it was, it was a book that was popular in the community, but famously the publishing industry does not listen to that community as much as it should. Um, and so the industry didn't really take much interest and the book ops were kind of ordering like one copy per shop. And, but that was fine with me. I was happy. And then something changed in some like a couple of months after it came out I don't know what, what changed I think we just had like enough people excited about the book that a book, bookshop started ordering more and then this production company got in touch in October 2020 so a few months after it came out and they said we'd love to make it into a tv show I I knew enough authors by this point that I knew you know most development projects end up in limbo and they never go anywhere they just they're just constantly being worked on. So I was like, sure, take it and develop it and have fun. And um, there are some other production companies that were interested, but this was the only production company that promised to cast autistic actors. So I said, yeah, like at, the, at this point, I was like, I will fight for that, but I don't think it'll ever get made. Um, mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we'll leave it to us. Uh, will you write some of the scripts? I said, sure, fine, whatever. And then a year later, we, we met with the BBC, we met with Netflix, we met with HBO, we met with lots of people. and. The BBC were the only ones that were absolutely com convicted, like they were ready to cast uh, diverse and autistic actors and crew as well. And um, so I was like, I hope it's them. And they greenlit us. I think we were the fastest greenlighting children's show in, in BBC, BBC history or something. It was really fast. So we had a meeting and then an hour later we, it was done. Mm. And that was October 2021. And then we went in the writing room for the next six months and wrote all the scripts and then in summer 2022 we filmed for a few months I think it was a 12-week shoot overall and then the show is out now in 2023 so it's actually that's the timeline which is unusually fast it's usually not that fast like I don't know if like charm will ever get greenlit <laughs> but but like it's in development um like so many people's books are um and then at some point if it doesn't get if it doesn't work out they will sell you back the right you'll get your rights back and you can sell them again but but spark was quick it happened quickly and I think that's because everybody was kind of on the same message because <laughs> they knew that I wasn't going to let them avoid casting authentically but that's the timeline <laughs> yeah right, right. so was that just after the the Blue Peter Prize that it got greenlit or 
Around kind that. of, yeah. It was after Blue Peter and Waterstones, um, which I did, I think probably did help because it became a bestseller. Um, and Blue Peter is obviously CBBC, so we were like, we're now in the family. <laughs> we're now part of, and I still haven't been invited back on and I really would like to be. I would love my gold badge at some point. But um, yeah, it was greenlit six months or so after Blue Peter, I think. And um, yeah, it was just they just got it I think they just they just understood what we were trying to do and what kind of story it was and um they were very supportive yeah Mm -hmm. so you mentioned the the neurodiverse cast and crew I I, I was curious about that because I think we hear quite a lot about the importance of autistic actors playing autistic roles um which I do think is is important I think you know there have been some great autistic characters played by non-autistic actors. Um, I think writing is probably more important than, than who, who. Yeah, actually, I, um, I wrote the the scripts. Um, uh, I wrote and consulted on the script writing. We had a brilliant team of writers, but me and Anna McCleary were the head writers. Um, and I, I just, I thought, I still maintain it's super important that autistics play autistics because, um, partly because I'm just I'm so sad about how difficult it is for disabled actors across the board. I recognize that all not, not all autistic people consider themselves disabled, but for the sake of the conversation, disabled actors of all um, disabilities have a difficult time getting cast. So I'm, I just felt personally, I really want to empower this, this group of actors. Um, the, and they bring things to the characters that are so natural to them and that children are now picking up on. There's kids watching going, oh, I do that with my hands, or I do. And it's just so much quicker than having to teach a neurotypical, because we're working with, with young actors. We're not working with um, Academy Award winners, or um, although they will be, they're all brilliant. They will be one day, but um, they're just, so, they're super young. So having this natural experience just cuts us a lot of time. And they were fantastic. We also have a lot of autistic and neurodivergent actors in the cast playing non autistic roles right so yeah. Actually, yeah so we've got our, our our three main leads um so we've got lola playing addy who's autistic and we've got georgia playing kitty who's autistic and we've got ella playing eleanor who's a character who's autistic from the past but uh caitlin who plays nina is also autistic and um, beth who play uh sorry uh emma who plays beth is neurodivergent otis who plays ravi is, is neurodivergent like there's so many neurodivergent actors not playing neurodivergent characters which is one of my favorite parts of the show is that we've got hidden neurodivergents <laughs> everywhere um it's not just the ones that are playing it um and, and the crew as well one of the directors and a lot of the um a lot of the art department like it's 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 important to me um because I was given a chance uh, people believed me when I said to them just as you said uh you know it's important to give us the chance to tell our own stories and with our own voice and I was given that opportunity so I really wanted the actors and the company to have that opportunity as well and I think they've nailed it but yeah the writing is definitely important I in publishing I've read so many really well-meaning depictions and I know they're written by really good people but I I come away from it going do you like autistic people like do you do you like us like this doesn't read like like you like us and I know that they're nice people I know that it's just that that kind of prejudice and although my stories will not be everybody's people will read mine and go oh that's not me um it still comes from a place of truth and it comes from a place of liking autistic people <laughs> so um hopefully it's 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 good but i agree with you i think writing is is super important to be authentic i feel like we're i hesitate to say we're entering a golden age of autistic representation but there's been so much so much a lot better just in the last you know two three years yeah um, definitely with autistic actors um writers and if even if not actual writers then autistic actors and consultants having serious yeah so um yeah chloe Chloe hayden you know just did an amazing job and was not officially part of the writing team but actually like really developed the character a lot and you know threw in a lot of herself yeah i think i think the internet's partly because of that i think networks are aware now that if some people don't like something they'll go online and they will tell you <laughs> so they're always a bit like how do we stop ourselves from trending on twitter how do we keep <laughs> um, unfortunately while their, their reasons might not always be uh pure the result is that we do get a lot better work and um even with document you know autism documentaries used to be so 
degrading and so voyeuristic and so focused on on one element of, of the spectrum and and I even now I think documentary filmmaking is becoming more um inclusive and a little bit more um from our own voices um it's still not great but um but the talk god the documentaries I used to see when I was a teenager they're just harrowing they're the way they oh god yeah yeah so that's not, as well <laughs> not always had a great record on this right um so when when inside our autistic minds was being developed I, I and I think a lot of autistic people were really quite worried about how that would turn out. Um, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I hear that it actually is really good, which is oh, good. I can't watch like I. There's a show on Netflix which I totally respect. It's it's a date. It's like Love on the Spectrum or something. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, I can't watch it because even I, the the autistics on it are great. They're lovely and they're way more interesting than anyone else that they spend time with but like the cutesy music and the like infantilizing I just can't do it but um but when documentaries are autistic led I do think they're much better and I just yeah 20 years ago it was like yeah I just yeah I mean people wouldn't young people say I don't think they'd believe it if they saw autism documentaries from 20 years ago so it's it is changing and I think I hope we're coming into a golden age (laughs) that would be amazing um I'm, I'm gonna mention pablo here as well i don't know if you're oh, i love pablo abel is oh, a nice. genius i love pablo pa- i keep correcting people because people are interviewing me a lot we're doing a lot of press at the moment for the show and people are like is this the first neurodivergent cast and i'm like no pablo has got an all neurodivergent voice cast and it's brilliant and abel's amazing and you should watch it it's on cbb's um yeah i love pablo um mm. it's great i'm not the demographic but I like oh, it. no but i mean oh, it's just delightful isn't it um yeah speaking of demographics i noticed you have a young adult romance novel coming out next year (laughs) yeah i do um i read a lot of ya and i read i mean when i was a ya when i was a young adult um i read everything i think that was literally everything that was physically published in that genre and i loved it and it really gave me a love of reading back um after a bit of a slump so um I was talking to my agent and she was like, do you want to think about doing something different? And I was like, absolutely. And I want to do something for, for for older kids because there's just some things we can't talk about in a middle grade, which is the, the books I write now, which is sort of eight to 12. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about like, there's just some of the things like we've touched on in this conversation, just those moments of um, not being so sure and have difficulty with self-esteem. Like there's just stuff that is more suited to an older age range than young plucky sort of 10 year olds so it's it's definitely to do with that and um and yeah it's and it's also always just to prove that autism is commercial and it's it's something that can be light-hearted and can be commercial in romance or in crime or in you know I was about to say a western but that's not that's not commercial um like in in commercial genre it's not something that has to be literary all the time or um or sad even like people always assume my books are sad because they're about autism and like they're not they're not sad yeah although there are some pretty upsetting (laughs) yeah there's some sad moments but like but that's the thing like to me they're not sad so when people are like oh I cried my eyes out I'm always like oh okay (laughs) like I left out the really harrowing stuff but like um yeah they're emotional I would say but they're not they're not um nobody ever dies so it's um, it's not Miss Murphy right yeah, she's tough. She's scary. Um, yeah. she. What was funny is when that book came out, I had loads of te- um that book kind of spark when it came out. Loads of people said, loads of teachers would come up and say, "Oh, I love the book so much. Like the kids love it. It, it flies off our library shelves." But there aren't any teachers like that, I think, anymore. And I was like, "You are delusional. <laughs> there are still so many." Yeah. Um, and and they're not just teachers. It's not specific to the teaching profession. They are in medicine. They are in um your office they are you know someone's office job they are in your your uh, locker room they are everywhere um her attitudes are still her attitude is still very prevalent and um so for, for people who haven't read it or seen the series yet um yeah. you um, just briefly describe her attitudes so well, miss murphy is um Addie, the main character's teacher in the novel, it opens with her ripping up Addie's work because her handwriting is untidy and she doesn't care if the work is really good. She just cares that the handwriting is untidy. And she kind of 
she's beloved by a lot of the other students, which is really important to me that she's not a teacher who's, because we all had those teachers that hated every single student equally. And that's fair enough. I think if you hate like every child equally, that's fine. But there, there, this was specifically based on a teacher who zeroed in on kids that were different. Maybe they were queer, maybe they were neurodivergent in my case. And she really zeroed in on us and, um, and would go out of her way to, to punish us um, for our natural traits. And in the book and in the series, Miss Murphy turns a blind eye to a lot of bullying that happens to Addie and kind of tries to use the system against Addie, which is really common. I talk to so many, and it's not just actually autistic people, it's again, people who were maybe gay in school or trans in school or were black in school or brown in school. And they're like, yep, I had that teacher that really like wanted to, um, you know, it became, the classroom became a microcosm and, um, and that's what's happening in a kind of spark. There's nothing graphic or frightening really, especially not in the show. The book's a little bit more tough. Um, the show is much more light. So if you're feeling um, a bit raw about this kind of subject matter, I would say the show is maybe easier than the book. But um, but yeah, she was a tyrant and the character is um, very calculating in their ableism. Long answer again. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's such a, such a common experience for oh, autistic God, yeah. who have been bullied by teachers and other authority figures. And it's something that we don't talk about enough. So harrowing as it was to read, it was great to see that in a Oh, in thank a, you. But, yeah. Uh, and I say that as a teacher, by the way. <laughs> um, I forgot you were a teacher. <laughs> but this is the thing. Yeah. I'm like, it's not a teacher thing. It's a people thing. Like... Hashtag not all teachers. Yeah, you know, yeah no teachers absolutely not. In fact, like, it's, um, it's just that teachers have so much power. And in the, be like, in the best way, um, like... I said this to a teacher once and I don't think they appreciated it and I do respect that but I was like kids books take place in school so much because I don't know like school's a bit like prison to a lot of kids it was to me and the teachers therefore become the wardens and if you're writing a prison drama the warden can't be like what's up buddy Are you okay like the warden has to be tough for it to be a, a good prison drama so it's also a narrative thing so I like really not all teachers like especially in this job I get to meet so many amazing teachers um and librarians so yeah not all teachers but uh, actually probably a lot of doctors um, as well. Um, I get a lot of people getting in touch saying, oh, I have a really terrible doctor <laughs> who tells me that like autism is not real. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's all, it's all kinds Positions of Positions of power combined with- Yes, absolutely. Power. Power, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're all just having a minute. <laughs> just thinking about um, <laughs> on that sort of theme like what do you think teachers should know or like what should we um, do about teachers well I don't I don't think neurodivergent teachers need to know anything I think I meet a lot of neurodivergent teachers and they're great but I think and, and I don't know how they do the job because I couldn't it's so difficult but um I think one thing that I see teachers do a lot so in a kind of spark in in the novel and also in the tv show a big part of it is to, to more than in any of my other books to talk about how masking is really bad and masking like burns you out and, and turns you into a wreck. And in the book, um, I deliberately have the, the twins, Nina and Kidi. Nina is a YouTuber and a blogger and her her YouTube persona is very different to her real life persona. And that's to show that like neurotypicals change the way they are but not in the same way that we do because Kiri out of the twins Kiri is the one that ends up passed out on the stairs because of autistic burnout she's the one that's ill she's the one that becomes so exhausted that she becomes nonverbal. like so it's to show that while we all experience you know we have to put on our different faces and change our our way of being autistics do it to such a degree that it's damaging and dangerous and 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 bad for them and that was the whole point of the book and I still get teachers <laughs> that, will re that have the book as their class read who are like the point is that we all mask everybody masks and I'm like stop it <laughs> I'm like please that's like basic reading comprehension <laughs> but um so I think it's that I think I would say to teachers like don't be afraid don't be afraid to be specific I think some teachers are maybe like people again they're thinking in the old fashioned way of, it's, it's kind of a bit like when people say, oh, I don't see color. Like, oh, I don't see color. You're not, you're, you're no color to me. And it's like, that's not really helpful. It's, I, I think, I can't speak for anyone, but like we're hearing from communities that they want you to 
to see their color and we want they want you to see their marginalization and to understand where they're coming from and I think it's the same with being autistic so it's for me I would love if teachers could just really engage with the text and realize it's okay to say these guys have it a bit harder in this regards maybe we should do more to help them because we don't have to go through all that so I would say to teachers keep doing what you're doing because most of you are great but not everybody has to be the same like that's that's not helpful to say that we're all the same and that neurotypicals go through exactly what autistic people do because it's not helpful and it doesn't bring us all together <laughs> because then neurotypicals are like well I'm doing it really well and you're not and it's, and it's like no we're different it's a it's we're different so that's why I'd say if that made any sense at all to anybody watching yeah um I think that that leads us back around to what you were saying before about how the teachers who are the worst to neurodivergent kids are quite often pretty awful in quite closely related ways to the queer kids right and oh, to yeah. you know, ethnic minorities often and people who are seen as weird basically people yeah. who, who are you know noticeably yeah. different yeah. um so it is it's worth making those parallels visible you know it's not that everyone everyone masks like okay in a way yes the presentation of self and everyday life is it's like a whole thing no. but yeah some people really have to hide who they are and others don't that's that's really um, um yeah i agree with that i think people in that regard a lot of people maybe don't realize they're bringing in outside prejudices into a classroom because the classroom becomes a little microcosm it becomes a little society and who in your society is thriving who are you allowing to thrive um, are you allowing your unconscious bias to dictate what's happening in the classroom because I've been with teachers who are gushing I'm, I can't I mean this is recorded as well and it just sounds like I'm going off on teachers but like I've been in a classroom where a teacher is a lovely person you can tell just a lovely person going on and on about how much they love the book the book's amazing it's, it's informed what they do and then I'm like fantastic and then a very obviously neurodivergent child comes up and you can see the dislike suddenly like the teacher suddenly is like oh this kid again and I'm always like that kid was me so like it's <laughs> like realize that you might have unconscious bias mm -hmm. um so I would say that which we all have to address like I have to address my unconscious bias all the time it's it's we all have it so yeah <laughs> that's why i'd say yeah um, i talk a lot about weird pride you know people yeah. taking pride in their difference and self-acceptance and I, I see that as a a very major theme in actually all of your books like there's so much oh, in, um people being made to feel lesser because they're different yeah and the power of um refusing to take that you know yeah. oh, and, okay. and say, yes i am bloody weird <laughs> I'm different and, it's, it's and I'm not going to change so yeah 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 cool I've just uh, noticed the shark t-shirt the shirt and I'm absolutely <laughs> it's absolutely like brilliant what what should I wear for this oh I have a shark shirt it's fantastic oh yeah. my god so I, I wanted to bring that up actually um <laughs> yeah uh Addie, Addie loves sharks right yeah. which is a uh, relatively unpopular special interests perhaps i think you, you talk a little bit about, about how well yeah, i mean compared with wales right there's a lot of people obsessed okay with right okay <laughs> and i'm um, thinking about extraordinary attorney Wu, um the korean series about an autistic lawyer i don't know if you've seen it i've heard of it i've not watched it i've seen it on tiktok love it it's it's um it's flawed um okay. But it's it's a lot of fun. Anyway, yeah, so she has these these moments of like epiphanies where she somehow relates the case to Wales. And it's like, oh, finally everything makes sense. And it's kind of cuts to a shot of Wales. Anyway. I, yeah. um, uh, I really want. You know, sharks, sharks are widely yeah, well, I think, very hostile creatures, right? Yeah. Well, the thing for me is I freaking love sharks. Like that that's not it, it wasn't done for the purpose of metaphor alone I absolutely love them I I read a lot of non-fiction as a kid and I would inhale books about sharks I just was obsessed um obsessive and I put that in the book because we're kind of taught all my books kind of talk about what stories have we been told as a society and are those stories true like a charm and like a curse explore that a lot mm. and the story that we're told about sharks 
is the same story over and over again. Every year, I feel, there is a blockbuster movie about a killer shark, and it's a big, great white, and the big, great white wants to kill everybody, and it it doesn't want to eat them, it just wants to kill them, and then seek revenge on their children and their family, and it's this crazy, maniacal monster. And no matter how many times that movie is made since Jaws, Hollywood is like, yes, another killer shark movie. (laughs) Never an orca, never a giant squid, always a shark. And so in a kind of spark, Addie makes a point where she's talking about the witches and she says, look, a guy made a movie about a killer shark 50 years ago. And the next day, a bunch of people got into their boats, went out and tried to kill a shark. Um, Stories have a lot of power. When we talk about sharks like this, we never talk about how they only kill seven people a year on average, which is a lot, but they don't jump out of the grocery aisle. They do not fly out of bus stops. They are in their own habitat, minding their business when they when we come into their space and provoke them. Um, so she's kind of saying, take what you think you know about this predator is and 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 ask yourself, is that story the truth? Um, when in fact most great whites don't care if you're in the water with them or not they'll just pass by Um, so that's kind of why it's there as well not just because I love sharks and I want everyone else to love them too but also because they've had a raw deal when it comes to being talked about just like autistic people just like the women who are persecuted they have had a, a a lie told about them and their perhaps their some sometimes negative qualities have been exacerbated so much that they've been monstered and that's the that, that's the parallel in the book um but someone asked me about that once they were like it's a great metaphor like is that why you chose the animal I was like kind of but also I love them I think they're great um they're so old <laughs> like they've been around for millions of years so yeah that's so that's why I l- was enthused to see that Fergus is wearing <laughs> a shark shirt um yeah, because there's something sort of similar in in like charm and like a curse, right? Yeah, Where the way that stories the, are. The yeah. Monsters are not, not really monsters. Like none of them are who who you expect to be monsters. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Um. So uh, another thing that I wanted to ask you about is um, translations and sort of international reach. So. First off, Like a Charm is, sorry, not Like a Charm, um, A Kind of Spark is, oh, it's on BBC, and it's also on a, an American channel, isn't it? B- BYU TV or something. Yeah, it's in, it's on, net, they send me a list of networks, and I've never heard of any of them, and I, I'm grateful, I'm grateful to them, but it's BYU, and then it's CBC in Canada, and it's ABC in Australia, and there's one in France and one in Germany as well. Um, yeah, and the BBC are just able to 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 send send it out to the world, and um, yeah. Um, and in terms of translation, um, yes, I think the French and German are going to be dubbed, maybe. Which, <laughs> but um, also the book is obviously in many many languages. Um, it's in um, Mandarin, it's in Japanese, it's in Korean, it's in French, Spanish, Italian. Uh, Swedish soon um, and it's just it's it's always interesting to me because I'm like the titles always translate slightly differently I mean the French version is called the invisible sparks um, and it's yeah I always wonder I wish I could speak all these languages because I'm because I'm very controlling and I'm like are you talking about autism properly are you, <laughs> are you being nice um, but I think I've met many of the publishers and they're such awesome people that I think they are and um but yeah, it's just published in Germany and I've been getting bullied online mercilessly for three years by German people going, when are we getting it in Germany? <laughs> and then finally have it. it's come out in Germany. So yeah. Um, it's been a big hit anywhere else. Sorry? It's been a big hit anywhere else yet. It's a big hit in Korea. Um, they tell me this is this is the part where someone is like no it wasn't but um it sold out it's hard back edition in, in korea and they're and they're reissuing it with some amazing art um it's done really well in italy um it's, italy has an incredible reading culture they're so great about children's books in italy um i get lots of people talk uh, tagging me in instagram from france and um and the germans are also excited for it as well and it did it did really well in the us we won um a bunch of awards and i got to fly to washington and meet the guy that wrote teenage ninja teenage mutant ninja turtles which was the most exciting part of the trip but um yeah that was my partner delivering tea um oh wow and i i also asked if we have that pop-up shark book do you know the one that i'm talking about 
Yes. Brilliant. Well, apparently we do have it, so that, that's good. Um, just going to quickly demonstrate that for the viewers at home who might, might not be familiar. Oh, it's stunning. It's an incredible oh piece God. of art. <laughs> so many <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, oh, anyway, that is stunning. <laughs> Yeah, Lancet Austin is the initial. Um, oh, amazing. What were we talking about? Oh, Korea. Um, I, I plugged a kind of spark at a Korean conference the other week. Um, oh, cool. As I, I was invited to talk about mostly the Leans project, the Learning About Neurodiversity at School project for the neuro second Korean Neurodiversity Forum. Um, so I wasn't, wasn't in Korea, but um, yeah. You know, my, my top recommendation for anyone wanting to understand about autism and neurodiversity is to read things by autistic writers. Yeah, um, and, and varied things. And yeah, definitely. My single top recommendation for, for that has been a kind of spark since I first read it. Um, now, I think oh, so. reading fiction in particular. Um, I'm not a fiction writer, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I understand the value of stories. Yeah, what's it been like meeting meeting readers and stuff? Like you've done quite a lot of visiting schools and um, like yeah, oh, it's the best thing ever. It's it's the best thing ever because uh, the book came out in lockdown, so it was it was a difficult time for all of us. Um, but we did lots of cool Zoom events like this, and it was actually really nice. It was actually really good because a lot of people that I write for maybe don't feel as comfortable coming to busy in person events, so they got to really celebrate the book online and we still obviously do a lot of online stuff but it's been incredible going into schools and into book festivals to meet readers um my readers are amazing i, I mean i i'm not biased but well I, I am biased but my 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 team have who work with lots of other authors are like oh there's just something different about Elle's readers they're really really great they have amazing they bring amazing art uh, one of them cro crocheted something which is on my my wall like they, they're incredible um they they create music they make they do amazing drawings and they do tiktoks now now they're making lots of tiktoks of the show um so they're the best ever they're amazing and um the best part is when you get to meet young neurodivergent people who are proudly openly autistic or openly adhd or whatever it is and you get to kind of breathe a sigh of relief and go oh it really is different how it was 10 years ago I feel like it really, really is. And um, even if they aren't a reader, which is very, you know, that's totally the luck of the draw. A lot of them probably won't be readers. Um, even if they're not hyperlexic and they're not someone who wants to read a book, just seeing an author who's like them is sometimes enough that they're like, oh, that's something. Because when I was their age, I didn't know that autistic adults existed. We just didn't see it. A team that was like just didn't happen. I remember googling it and finding out that like Dan Aykroyd was autistic. I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. Um, but I didn't see it, so it's really nice that they can see it, even if they don't take it. If not a book person, but when they are a book person, it's incredible. It's the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they're my, they're the best. Love the readers. Incredible. Um. I've got a few questions from um, people in, in the audience. Oh. Um, do you prefer writing for younger or older audiences? Like, um, I the funny thing is that I try. I don't sit down and write like, okay, now I'm going to write for children, so I'm going to talk like this, and I'm going to remove this, and I'm going to do that. My publishers, I just write what I want to write, and my publishers will tell me if like that's one cigarette too many or that's one glass of wine too much or that word's too strong don't use that they do all that stuff so I just write how I would write for anybody I don't sit down and think I'm writing for children it's why I could never it's why I don't do picture books or younger uh, I get asked a lot to do picture books and uh, lower middle grade which is like five to seven and I just say no that's not my my skill set because I don't that's a very very difficult thing to do and it takes real talent to write well for that age group and I I don't do that I I just write how I would, I would would write for adults um you just obviously can't do certain content so I don't I don't really change, change it depending you know the difference between the YA and the middle grade is that the YA just has slightly more adult content but the way I write about it isn't really any different um and because of that I'm really lucky that my books and now the show um, I tried to do that with the scripts on the show as well. I didn't, you know, it, there were still a lot of notes from the BBC of like, we have to do this because it's for children. Um, but 
my lucky thing is that my audiences for the show and the books are so varied in age. They are mostly children because that's who they're marketed at. But I have 70 year olds who are like, I've read every book and I and I've got, you know, married mums and dads and teachers and library. Like it's just it's a very, very broad church of people. And I think that that can only happen if you're kind of willing to not patronize people and not occasionally I think we're in a really talking about golden ages I think we're in a golden age of reading for children um um, despite all the celebrity authors but um I will read sometimes a children's book and it's clearly been written by someone that's forgotten what it's like to be a child and um a lot of my trauma is from my childhood so I never forget what it's like to be (laughs) so I'm happy to tap back in I don't think I could write a book about someone in their 30s which I am I'm 30 years old I don't think I could write that because I haven't processed it yet but um but I'm I'm processed childhood enough to write about it but I I don't put on a silly kind of children's voice so (laughs) I think I think let's respect that and I think adults can tap into the the text a bit more easily because of that if that makes sense yeah yeah I've always thought that it's a terrible shame that so much stuff is marketed only at kids or only at a particular age group yeah like I always try and think I'm not comparing my books to this but I always try and write the books like a Pixar film because I always I love Pixar and I'm like Pixar's for everyone they they know that grown-ups are they they and they just write you know for everybody and that's what I try and do mm. um I think if you're under seven you probably won't enjoy my stuff but anyone older I don't like to put an upper age limit on stuff because I'm like I think anyone can enjoy it and yeah we really segregate kids like we really um you know we've had so many adults get in touch about the show and they're like I'm not the demographic but I loved it and I'm kind of like you're the demographic is anybody older than seven like it's really like it's fine <laughs> it's 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 just inclusive of everyone rather than exclusion excluding children you, you did a master's in creative writing in You're, publishing the publishing okay right 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 huh. that's when i learned i i did my dissertation on um um the lack of neurodiversity in children's publishing and that's what started this whole mess um because i was like it was something like 0.005 percent and i was like that is nonsense um and we'd go to like diversity and inclusivity panels and they would be on like the third floor of an ancient building with no lift and you'd be like well what if a person in a wheelchair wants to come to the diversity panel (laughs) like they can't get to the like it was that it was it was just like publishing was completely like not thinking about disability in any way so that's what started everything but yeah I did a master's in publishing um (laughs) With, with the intention of working in publishing and um, not as a writer but as an editor and then just things changed um got another question from someone in the, in the audience um do you find it easier to write autistic characters than neurotypical characters in terms yeah. of dialogue internal thoughts and so on is that something you've been conscious of in your writing yeah that's that's my brain i only know that i can imagine what neurotypical people think and what because i'm I know, you know, everyone, everyone's brain is different. This is the thing I get pulled off about a lot. Like everybody's brain is different, of course. But when I talk to neurotypical people and they're like, I don't have a stream of consciousness. I'm like, you don't have a stream of consciousness. Um, like we all just, everyone has a different kind of brain. So I think because I write first person uh, present tense, um, it's just easier to use my own. Um, and that's what you should do as a writer anyway. It's use your writer's voice in fiction. Um and if I, I don't know, I, I just, if I wrote neurotypical, I hope I wouldn't bring in my own prejudice and make it really dull and just be like, oh, the environment feels fine and there's no bright lights and there's no loud noises and I'm just feeling normal. <laughs> like I do, I could try not to be, um, but I, I, I like writing autistic characters. I feel more comfortable doing that. Um, I didn't do it for 25 years. I told myself I wasn't allowed to do that and that that wasn't proper and that's not what people want. So making up for a lot of lost time I quite like it <laughs> it's, it's a privileged thing there isn't there um because if you're neurodivergent then you have been exposed to nav- narratives yeah, what it's like to be neurotypical <laughs> your whole life um same yeah. way that's that women inevitably are constantly exposed to yeah you know, what it's like to be a man which it's much easier for men to avoid learning about <laughs> learning what it's like yeah. to be- <laughs> um good comparison yeah definitely um 
Another question. Do all the, the neurodivergent or autistic protagonists you write take inspiration from how you are? That's a good question. I wasn't scoffing at the question. I was just scoffing at the I, I just pictured the main character from Like a Charm being inspired by me. And I was like, no, she's not inspired by anybody. She just likes everybody. Um, I think I try and keep it. It's a good question because I think I try and keep it to my own lived experiences when it comes to neurodiversity i don't start playing fast and loose with reality in that sense because i am very conscious that people when you're writing about your own marginalized experience there is a microscope on you like people people are waiting for you to trip up um and in a way that they would never do to a neurotypical writer writing about autistic people but you have a microscope on you, fair, which is fair enough. And so I just try and keep in my lane. I don't start making grandiose claims that aren't something I've experienced or aren't something that I know lots of other autistic people have experienced. Um, so I, I I guess they're inspired in that sense that they they share a lot of what my diagnosis and my, my traits um, just so that I can keep things truthful and authentic. Um, and because I'm always saying my books aren't universal to every neurodivergent person, um, but it does come from truth. It's not imagined. The rest of the story is imagined um, enormously, and most of the things that happen in the books are imagined, but the neurodivergent experience is very true to my own, um, just to kind of keep the story grounded in, in something quite real, um, which I think is what that question is kind of asking, and it's a good question. Um, but yeah, that's where the, the grain of truth always is in the characters. But of course, I mean, you you write quite diverse characters, like they're, they're very different from each other. So yeah, they are personality wise, they're very different, but um, especially the third one. But um, yeah, they, they, they definitely are. And um, yeah, because it, that's the fun part is getting to explore different personalities and different characters. Um, but I don't start making things up about autism because I think enough people have done that. So I, I only, and I also am careful never to think just because I do something as an autistic person, it means that it is because of autism. So I'm mm. always just trying to keep that line very straight. And I think it works because I have so much feedback from people saying, oh yeah, I really, people say, I, I, people say, oh, I'm nothing like Addy, but I really relate to this part. And I'm like, that's good because that's the part that's, that's true. <laughs> so hopefully, um, that's that's my philosophy with with writing the main characters well it's, it's three minutes to seven um i did bill this as a, a q a in book reading i don't know if you'd be up for just reading like yes a, i will uh, read yeah. <laughs> i told fergus at the start right. i was like i really i'm not good at reading but um okay um you read a lot don't you audrey and i are walking home from school it's a new routine it took a little getting used to my walk to and from school was my time to prepare for the chaos of a busy day. But Audrey isn't overly talkative and doesn't bombard me with questions, so I don't mind so much. I'm reading about this woman, Maggie. She used to live here in Juniper. She was one of the witches. Maggie? Yeah. They said she was a witch, but she wasn't really. I can't believe you do extra work outside school, Audrey laughs. I don't always, I admit. Only if I find it interesting. When I don't find something interesting, my brain switches off. Yeah, I can see it sometimes, Audrey says, when Murphy was talking, when Miss Murphy was talking about long division, I could see you staring out of the window. I wrinkle my nose. I can't help it. But then you know so much about all of these witches, she points out. I didn't do any reading on Maggie, that's for sure. My sister says my brain is like a computer, I explain. It starts with no information and then just collects more and more and it never stops. Are all brains like that? Maybe, but mine crashes every time it gets overused. We walk without talking for a little while before Audrey speaks softly. So... What's wrong with you? I hesitate, trying to work out if she's being mean or not. I found your sister's video, she says. She was doing your makeup? I'm autistic, I finally say, looking up at the cloudy Scottish sky. October is bringing the cold and the rain. The wind hits the trees on our street with incredible force. I don't know how they stand it. What's that? It's a neurological condition. I touch my temple. It's a difference in the brain. It's a spectrum. Some people have it and don't speak at all, and some have it and talk a lot. Like you? Yeah. And Audrey trying to understand. I can tell. What does it do? I feel things a bit more, sounds, sights. I can hear people down the street without straining. I can see tiny details and things, things other people can't. I process things differently. And sometimes I kick a stone on the pavement. Sometimes it's really difficult for me to read people's faces. If they're not being honest with their faces, I sometimes don't understand. Okay. And that's just a little of a kind of spark. That's a great description. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Um, well, I guess that, that's us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. I'm to go. Thanks for coming, everyone. And thank you for having me, Fergus. This is really yeah. nice. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.